Brett from the annual DEF CON convention. This meeting was held in exciting Las Vegas, Nevada from July 9th through the 11th, 1999. This is videotape number 49, Firewalls, Trends and Problems. Okay, I'll just cut you. I'm going to get shorter a little bit. Um, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that are going on with firewalls right now. Firewalls are probably the most uh, popular tool that's out there to secure a network right now. And what many businesses aren't realizing is that they're not everything. They're getting firewalls and they're pretending that they have a complete solution to every problem they might have. And they don't realize that they still have viruses, they still have insider attacks, they still have attacks going on against the services that they have available. Is that better? Okay. Um, one of the most important selling points to firewalls right now tends to be fear, uncertainty, and doubt. A lot of managers are throwing away a lot of money for things that they don't really understand. One company that I saw on their webpage had a demonstration of hackers breaking into your computer because you didn't have their firewall. And they actually took you step by step how hackers were using WinHack Gold and Legion to attack your open file shares over through finding users on IRC. I thought it was a I thought it was quite a joke. Um, one of the quotes they had on their page was, think of the hours you can spend going through your personal data after he downloads it. And they actually had they had pictures of uh, personal information and um, billing and whatnot for the person. I thought it was funny. Um, the truth of the matter is that it only all the firewall actually did was block file sharing, and it didn't even use uh, packet filtering to do it. It used MBT stat after the after someone had already connected, and it didn't do any other packet filtering whatsoever. It did not support it. It pretended to um, get rid of several backdoors as well. It claimed to filter out several hundred of them. And when I disassembled the software, I found out that the only thing it ever attempted to get rid of at all was backdoor. This. Actuality, it wasn't even successful in removing back office. <laughs> Although I'd love to see how they work with BOTK. Um, another article that I saw in a local paper was talking about many companies can't afford firewalls and it quoted them as all being $10,000 or more and said that in order to run them at all, you needed a full-time administrator who would command a salary upwards of $100,000 a year and I don't, I don't think that's quite too accurate. Um, it claimed how evil hackers would run rampant through your network and then, funnily enough, the article actually ended talking about a specific firewall and gave you their website so you could purchase it, which I thought was inappropriate for a newspaper. Um, a lot of people just simply don't realize what is still open when they have a firewall up. A recent example would be Microsoft's Internet Information Service. A uh, bug came out in that that allowed an attacker over only port 80, nothing other than web traffic, to gain control of a web server, and they did not need any other means to connect to the machine at all, which would pass through any firewall that allowed web browsing, including Microsoft's own site. Firewalls simply aren't intended to solve every security problem. Although integration with uh, intrusion detection and virus scanning over predefined methods of downloading are helping to make a more complete solution out of it, but there are other things that need to be approached. One of the big problems with a lot of the firewalls out there right now is people simply aren't able to manage them. They don't know how. The methods of management are a little confusing for them. Um, and sometimes they're trying to install them on too many different machines rather than having one integrated firewall and they're using remote administration methods to get to them. When they're doing this, they're often using very insecure methods to manage their firewalls, often remotely from outside of their own networks. And they're using web browsers to do it. They're using SNMP to do it. Although some of them are actually using secure encrypted methods to get to them, I don't advocate any remote administration outside of your own network. One firewall I saw claimed that SNMP would be the future of firewalling administration. And, and they predicted that very soon every firewall would support it as the sole means of administration. 
for other solutions, some vendors are actually uh, installing the, and configuring the firewalls remotely using tools such as PC Anywhere or simply Telnet or SSH. Um, another problem with this, other than people being able to sniff the traffic to see what passwords are used to get to it, to see what rule sets are being applied, is that you can't always trust who's going to be working for a vendor. If a vendor's got 10,000 different customers who need their firewalls administered and they're sending someone to do yours from the office, you don't know if the person is confident. You don't know if the person has any is in touch at all with what your service or your business or your organization needs. And you can't always trust them to be honest with what they're doing. Another problem with firewalls is that many of the people installing them do not know what they're trying to configure, what they're trying to allow and disallow. Uh, one of the major problems with, is with ISPs because the most secure method of setting up a firewall is to not deny all traffic unless it's specifically permitted. But with ISPs, there's a lot of services that you wouldn't normally see in organizations. People want to use Microsoft Net Meeting. They want to play Quake. They want to play Duke Nukem over the net. They want to use AOL Instant Messenger. And a lot of administrators don't don't know what ports that these things are using and they don't know how they work. One of the things that I found most useful for determining that was to grab the services file from InMap, which seems to be the most comprehensive that I've seen as the RFCs are outdated due to a lot of the services that are proprietary. Um, the easiest way to set things up would be to use one of the more user-friendly administration, the user-friendly firewalls if you're not familiar with them, and find out, if you refer to things by names, everybody can't memorize every port number that they're going to have to use. Although for those of you who know, I still prefer command line. <laughs> Another thing that's very interesting to me is the integration with other tools. Now that a lot of firewalls are using intrusion detection, they're using virtual private networking. Some of them support virus scanning over FTP and HTTP. And this allows a lot of other problems to be solved through the one device. Um, I'd like to talk about virtual private networking for a minute because it's one of the key selling points in a lot of firewalls right now that a lot of people are going after. And it's probably one of the least understood features. A lot of people don't understand that there's different forms of cryptography. There's different codes that people use, and some are really good and some aren't. And there's some things that have been broken and people are breaking. PPTP is a good example. Microsoft based it off the RC4 stream cipher, which isn't all that bad, but their implementation was really poor. And its security was based simply on a user's password, which, as most of you know, can be cracked in usually in a few hours. Um, if you're going to go with VPN support on any firewall, the things I would suggest using are... Louder. When you're looking for VPN support on a firewall, I would really suggest going with something that's more tested and uh, secure, such as SSL or IPSEC. I like the protocols a lot better. It gives you a choice of which algorithms you want to use when you're running the firewall. And uh, when you're setting up the servers and you have the choice over which algorithms you're going to use, a lot of people argue over whether Diffie-Hellman or RSA is better for key exchange. I don't think it matters. Um, a lot of people don't realize that Diffie-Hellman's been around for a long time because it's been uh, patented and a lot of businesses haven't been able to use it in their products until recently. But both are fairly both are really secure and they're probably equally secure. It has been proven that if you can break Diffie-Hellman, you can also break RSA, but the reverse has not true. I'm sorry. Yes, if you break Diffie-Hellman, you can also break RSA, but the reverse is not true or hasn't been proven to be. Um, on the client side, you don't have a lot of choice, so you're out of luck. But um, as for encryption, some places are still using DES and RC4, and I'd say don't go there. Um, you're going to have to use something a little bit stronger. I'd prefer uh, triple DES, DES, um, IDEA. One thing not to be fooled by if you want to choose DES over IDEA is that De triple DES is often claimed as being 168 bit. The key is indeed 168 bits, but it isn't that strong because of the usage of multiple encryption. In reality, it only has the strength of what you would expect 112 kit, 112 bit key to be. So you're really only getting double encryption out of it. I prefer IDEA myself. It's a little bit longer and a little bit faster.
another thing a lot of firewalls are trying to market is uh, the use of demilitarized zones. Demilitarized zones really aren't anything new. It's something that's been out there for a long time. It sounds cool, and so a lot of people are claiming to support it. All the demilitarized zone is is an intermediary network between the firewall that you have against the internet and another firewall that you have between your local network. And some firewalls have multiple, more than two interfaces, and they allow you to set up a demilitarized zone on that firewall. I don't think it's such a bad idea security-wise. It's just that it's not anything special. It's not anything that most people don't already have supported in their firewalls, and it's not something they pay a lot of extra money for. In a demilitarized zone, all you're going to have is you have your outside firewall, which is connected between you and the internet, or a wide area network. You have a few intermediary machines. Often they're machines that don't have the security that you want inside your local network, or they have services that you don't consider to be secure and don't want them on your local network so that other things can be compromised. And often as well, there's a proxy server that will allow you to connect to the proxy server so that it can make connections for you to the inside. Um, another thing that I'm seeing a lot of lately is software firewalls, whereas the better firewalls that I had seen in the past were mostly hardware. There's a lot of nice software firewalls coming out. They're easy to configure. They're fairly secure. They run fast enough to support your bandwidth. However, one of the big problems with software firewalls is, is there is an underlying OS that was made for general purposes. It was not made specifically to be a firewall. If you get a Cisco PIX box, it was made to be a firewall. There was nothing else made into that OS. And if they do a good job in products such as that, the OS is OK. In software firewalls, you have to look at the underlying OS because it's running on Unix or it's running on Windows NT. And if there's still problems with that underlying OS, your firewall can also be compromised. There was a recent problem with one firewall where in-map scans would actually crash the whole machine because of its integration with the underlying TCP IP stack on NT. A small sect of uh, software firewalls are PC firewalls, which I really am not in favor of in most cases. Uh, they're not good for office environments because they're hard to administrate. Most of them don't support remote administration. They want you to configure each machine individually, and it's not very feasible. Another problem is that users often want to tinker with them, and if they and they can change them, they can either make them very insecure or they can destroy their network functionality on their machine because they won't be able to get to anything anymore. Um, another problem with PC firewalls, especially on Windows platforms, which most PCs are running now, Windows 95 starts up its networking services before anybody logs in. Your file sharing is already open and people can access that if they have the proper privileges. But the firewall, most PC firewalls will not start until after you log in. So if I log out of my Windows 95 machine at work and I've got a little PC firewall running that I think is protecting me, until I log back in, somebody can access those file shares and can do what they want. They can, if they're open, they can get to them. If they have passwords, they can brute force them. Um, another problem is that in many cases, if they connect to them before I log into my machine, they can maintain that connection after the firewall starts because most firewalls, for um, performance purposes, do not analyze every single packet. They look at special information in that packet and they see if it's opening a new connection. And if it's opening a new connection, they apply it to its rule set and they decide whether they should allow that connection to continue. If they decide it shouldn't, they deny it and they close it down. When the, when the connection's already established because somebody connected to my machine before I logged in, they can maintain that connection because there's no opening of a connection to filter out. It's merely traffic and it assumes that that connection has already been authenticated and has already been assumed to be OK and it lets it run the way it is. One solution that I can see to this in PC firewalls because they pose a different problem is to close is to run through the open sockets on the machine and close down everything that does not apply to the rules that does not is not allowed by the rule set. Um, as, uh, outside of the Windows PC firewalls, I think that those three-layer firewalls that are distributed with Unix, especially through BSD and Linux, I, I think they're pretty good firewalls. I like to use them. I use uh, IPFW at home on my FreeBSD machine. Um, one problem with the free PC firewall, or the freeware firewalls is that they're not as supported as some of the commercial things. Uh, they do have the documentation, but you're not going to get the kind of tech support that you want if you need it. Um, however, I find them highly configurable. I find them very secure. I find them easy to use myself, if you know what you're doing with them. Um, 
one of my favorite PC or my freeware Linux firewalls is TCP wrappers, which you can wrap around the services normally starting by NID on your machine. And the reason I like TCP wrappers is because they can create a lot of fun for me. Because with TCP wrappers, other than allowing and denying connections, you can also run outside programs using information from the connection as arguments to those programs. And so on a particularly annoying Friday night, it's often fun to look up some denial of service scripts and watch kitties scanning for back orifice crying when their machines crash. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Another type of firewall that I'm seeing that I think is a waste of money, which uh, is going to be talked about in a minute here, are a lot of the censorship firewalls. And they're trying to scan out porno sites, they're trying to get rid of Playboy, they're trying to get rid of badkittycam.com so you can't get to them from work. And one of the things I, I find the problem with is that these firewalls often cost ten to $15,000 or more. And they're using a list of sites that they deemed inappropriate and they don't want you to get to from work. And the problem is, one, they often, you can often get around them, especially if you find sites that aren't included in their list. And another problem is, why do you need to pay $15,000 to prevent your users from doing something you don't want them to do at work when all it takes is a nice meeting with their manager, system administrator, and a threatening of losing their job? They're not going to do what they're not supposed to be doing, or they're going to be fired. I don't think it's worth spending $15,000 to prevent them from looking pornography at work. Um, one of the other things that I'm liking is I'm seeing a lot of new tools coming out that you can use to analyze your own firewalls. You can find out what's going on, find out what's working, find out what's not. Um, the tools I like to use most are Nmap and Firewalk. Nmap allows you to use fragmented packets, which you can try to pass under some firewalls. Uh, a fragmented packet does not contain everything that a firewall needs to analyze the packet, and so it has a few choices. It can either drop the packet completely, because it's fragmented, it can support them, and it can queue the first part of the fragment and wait for the rest of the fragment to come in, and then decide whether to allow it to pass or not. Or it can simply allow them all through, and many of them just allow them all through. Um, more firewalls are starting to support queuing of those packets so they can decide whether they should be uh, restricted or not. However, there's a denial of service problem with these similar to SIM flooding, and that if you send the first part of several fragmented packets and accuse them, it will quickly run out of memory to queue more packets because it's all in use, and you never send the second half of the firewall, and often freeze it up. Um, a firewalk that I like to use other than Nmap is a nice little trace route type utility that allows me to figure out what a lot of the problems are with my rule set and allow me to find out what can get through and allow me to gather information about the host inside my network. And I find, it is, I find both of them especially interesting because it allows me to do before what you know, often it took proprietary commercial software to do, such as ISS or CyberCop might have done for me. That's all I have for right now. I'd like to pass control over right now to Mr. Bennett. Is it available? Thank you. Tom has uh, embedded appliances in the company operating with our underlying operating system specific problems. Uh, some of the things we've given that one of the big problems that you'll see with a lot of firewalls that have underlying OS is even the hardware where it's specifically made to be a firewall is if they allow you to connect to those machines, they allow you to attempt to hack those machines. So even if I'm running a stripped down version of uh, BSD on my appliance firewall, if there are any services running on that machine that I can connect to that could possibly allow me to get access, it's a bad thing because it will allow me, if I know what to do, to hack that firewall and take control of it. I usually use BSD rather than Linux. I've read a little bit about IP chains, but I haven't used them yet. Are you wanting to know what I prefer? Or? He was asking me what was advisable for the firewalls that are running on Windows NT. Um, most of the firewall. Oh, shut up, Brandon. <laughs> most of the firewalls I've dealt with NT, it's been Checkpoint or Guardian. Um, I prefer.
for Linux firewalls myself. I like command line. I like just get down and dirty. I don't like to deal with the GUI in most cases. Thank you. Um, I don't really have any preference um, over any of the major commercial ones. I think the best thing is just to decide what you need for what you're doing. I mean, if you're running a small ISP, you don't need to spend $15,000 on a copy of Checkmate with VPN support. And you can probably get away with a small freeware firewall. However, if you're running a large corporation, you're probably better with going with one of the major companies who can give you the support you need, who can come down and help you if you have problems, who can tell you what you need to do. Is anyone showing support for the free Is anyone showing support for the I don't know at this time of anyone that's selling support for the freeware systems. However, I don't think it would be a bad idea because there are, much, there are oftentimes a much better alternative to the commercial firewalls for smaller organizations and businesses. So I'd like to see that. Can you, can you speak up a little bit? I can't hear well. I'm going to explain to Jack. He said that this will be some support for the users to be running firewalls. But if you guys really want to see me naked, you're going to have to go to my website. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, you're a little too kinky even for this group. Okay, as you can see, our multimedia extravaganza here. We're uh, seeing if the cords will stretch. Hey, there's a lot of cord. That might even work. All right. Follow me. <laughs> Introducing Bennett Hasselton. Hazel, Hazelton. <laughs> yes, I'm going to be talking about a piece of software called the Anti-Censorship Proxy, which can be used for getting around firewalls and proxy servers. Not talking about firewalls and proxy servers that have bugs in them, but this, can, this is something that can actually be used for circumventing correctly implemented firewalls and proxy servers that are built to censor certain websites. That's something that uh, Stephen talked about near the end. Also talking about different forms for uh, other, other types of software-based censorship and how you can get around some of them. Uh, a lot of this talk is about the politics of the situation. There are bills in Congress now proposing that all schools will have to spend lots of money on a particular company's product that censors certain websites from being accessed from the computer. So, and this is a, a political discussion that's been going on for about two or three years now. It's very relevant these days. Uh, my email address is going to be um, up here on the projector at the, again at the end. My name is Ben Hazelton, known to the underground uh, hacker elite inner circle as Ben Hazelton. Um, if someone wants to christen me as something like uh, Death Maximus, Thunderwolf, Warp Spider, or something before I leave this conference, uh, go ahead. I don't have a name like that quite yet. Um, in general, the different categories of, uh, of software-based blocking that uh, we've dealt with circumventing. There are the very simple ones that everybody's sort of like Surfwatch, Cyber Patrol, and NetNanny. When you install these, all they do is they replace some crucial system files with their own hooked version of the system files in order to force themselves to keep running all the time. But if you if you have a test machine and you can you can install a copy of these and you can use a, a file uh, file system and registry profiling system and difference analyzer to see what keys it enters in the registry and what files it replaces. And then it's just a matter of writing, writing a Windows script that can reverse that process in order to un forcibly uninstall those uh, programs from your computer without the administrative password, of course. Uh, there are other programs that are slightly stronger and harder to defeat, but are still client-side programs that reside on the computer that you're sitting in front of, uh, ones like Foolproof and Fortress. And these are, these are mostly desktop access control programs, which means they uh, they can restrict certain operations and they don't themselves censor websites, but they are meant to be used in conjunction with another program like Cyber Patrol. And you're supposed to use something like Foolproof to make it harder to remove Cyber Patrol from the computer. And uh, these are a little more sophisticated and they can do things like make it impossible to boot from a floppy disk and access the, uh, access the file system on the machine because they scramble the master boot record on the hard drive in the machine to make sure that you can only access files on the machine if you boot from the hard drive. And then the 
the really serious challenge is getting around things like firewalls and proxy servers, the, the ones that are not installed on the machine that you're sitting in front of, so you can't write a script to, uh, to get around them. It's a matter of making contact with a, a website outside the network that is not blocked by the firewall or proxy server and opening a sort of communications channel with that website that can transparently serve you the websites you're trying to access which are blocked by the firewall sitting between you and your accomplice outside the network. But part of the politics of the whole situation is how do, how do these sensorware companies, so-called sensorware, like Surfwatch and Cyber Patrol and the, and the firewall companies, how do they determine uh, what URLs are going to end up on their lists of sites to be blocked from access on that network? Part of it is uh, when, you, when you access a page on a machine that has one of these programs installed on it, the page as it's downloaded will be scanned for certain keywords, certain words in the title, certain words like sex that appear in the URL, and then if it meets enough of those conditions, it will get blocked automatic automatically. Um, also, the software company keeps a list of URLs known only to the company that contain material they consider inappropriate. And if a URL that you try to access is on that list, it will be blocked regardless of whether it meets any of those other criteria. And so allegedly, these companies keep employees whose job it is to surf the web all day and look for inappropriate material. I actually read an interview with one of these guys once who worked for a company called N2H2, which makes a product called Bess, and he said that he just he just come home after a long day of uh, searching smutty websites for material. He uh, stopped at a bookstore on the way home and was just trying to relax, pulled some books off the shelves and started reading. Eventually he realized he was not actually reading the pages, he was just scanning them for dirty words, because that's what he'd been doing all day. He was like, oh geez, I've got to get this out of my head, got to get a life. Um, the list of URLs that are maintained by these companies, uh, but they, they, they keep a copy of the list on a central server, and then if you have a client-side version of a program like Cyber Patrol installed on your machine, periodically the companies encourage you to download a latest updated version of the URL list, uh, so that you'll just, because the web is constantly changing, we're always adding new entries to the list. And uh, th this is in order to keep the software up to date, and sometimes they will start charging you for continued updates after a uh, six months free period or something like that. And the, the lists that, as they reside on your machine are always stored in an encrypted format because they are considered to be trade secrets by the companies which have invested considerable effort in compiling these lists. So they, don't, it, they do not, in fact, want their customers to know what is on the list of sites they consider appropriate. There are something like 50 to 100,000 sites on a typical list. And, uh, Generally, they try to keep these secret. A lot of the politics involved in the fight over, say, whether blocking software should be uh, forcibly installed in the libraries that receive federal money is about whether the blocking software companies are doing their job competently and how, in fact, they manage these lists of sites which they consider to be inappropriate. Um, and there are lots of examples that people talk about of sites that are that are, are blocked that most people feel should not be. Uh, these days, generally, if you ask anybody what is, what is embarrassing or what is wrong with blocking software, um, almost the only thing that everybody ever says is breast cancer sites or chicken breast recipes. People say those will be blocked because they contain the word breast in the title. That's true, but that is a very uh, trivial, very bad example, and that's really not where all the controversy is coming from. That would fall into the category of pages that are blocked due to keyword scanning. In other words, the the program is downloading the page and it scans it for particular words like breast and the site's not blocked because it's on the company's list of inappropriate pages it's just blocked because it happens to have that keyword there. That's one example. There are also um, some companies, their products work by, by in order to block a site they block it by IP address and there are some uh, hosting companies which host multiple web pages on the same IP address and you can have uh, hundreds of sites sharing the same machine, same IP number and if one of those sites get blocked, they will all get blocked uh, at the same time just because of the way the software works. So there are lots of examples of sites that are blocked for that reason as well. There are sites that are blocked for political reasons, which means the company delib deliberately blocked it and maybe they, uh, they've tried to avoid controversy, but somebody discovered it was blocked and publicized it and the, the company defended it for whatever reason. Um, there are also pages that are blocked which prove that the company is not in fact reviewing all of the sites on their URL list to determine if they meet their criteria. This is the main area where 
uh, my website, Peacefire, has uh, concentrated most of our effort is in coming up with examples of pages that are on these lists of allegedly inappropriate URLs that no human being could have looked at and determined are uh, inappropriate. But what it appears the company is doing is they are running some sort of spider which is going on crawling pages on the web and examining them for certain keywords and then adding them directly to the URL list of inappropriate sites without necessarily having a human being examine them in between to determine if they meet their criteria. And I'll have some more examples of that in a second. First, some examples of pages that are blocked due to keyword scanning. Uh, in 1996, a little bit after Surfwatch came out, uh, people were talking about how the White House web page about Bill and Hillary and Al and Tipper was blocked by Surfwatch because the page was called couples.html, and Surfwatch was set to block any page that had the word couples in the URL, allegedly because that, that indicated it was uh, sexually explicit. Um, and the White House webmaster had to rename the page principles.html in order so that uh, Surfwatch using families could access it. There was a page that NASA posted about Pathfinder's exploration of Mars. It, would call, it was called marsexpl.html. Did you catch it? M-A-R-S-E-X-P-L.html. And Cyber Patrol and Surfwatch blocked it because it had the word sex in the URL. And, uh, the, and among the frequent last questions maintained by the guy who wrote the page, he said, I set up a separate copy of this page here in case your, your computer has uh, blocking software on it. You can access this page anyway. Um, I found one example of, of an organization, sort of a, a support uh, page for children that had cancer, and the organization was called uh, the organization was called Touch, and it was an acronym that stood for something. But in any case, Surfwatch blocked all pages that had the word Touch in the URL, and so this uh, this page was not accessible. Also, some some software blocked you from searching anything that had the word teenagers in it, like teen smoking or teen safety, just because uh, they feel the search engine would turn too many ma matches for pornographic sites if you search for anything that says teenagers. For another example of pages that are blocked because they shared an IP address with, a, uh, with another blocked site, these, uh, these are just some of the well-known examples. Filteringfacts.org is a page advocating the use of blocking software in libraries, and the ISP hosted on the same sheet as another site that was, about, that was blocked by surfwatching the drugs and alcohol category. So uh, filteringfacts.org was, in fact, blocked at one point by surfwatch, which is recommended by Filtering Facts as one of the products for use in libraries. And one that is supposed to not make a large number of these kinds of mistakes. Uh, there was a recent Wall Street Journal, Journal article about other pages blocked for the same reason. Uh, Minnow.org, which is maintained by Martin Minow, who is related to the FCC Commissioner Nate Minow, and I think works at Apple Computer now. Uh, he's very famous. And then a friend of mine uh, registered PluginPray.com and did not actually, and neither one of these people actually put anything on their pages, but they were shared with another page that had to be blocked, and they discovered they were blocked by Surfwatch. Um, for examples of pages blocked for political reasons, uh, a lot of the a lot of the blocking programs block pages which advocate uh, marijuana legalization, not like uh, normal.org. And remember, um, you know these these products are used in large numbers in schools, and technically, sites that advocate a political point of view are constitutionally protected material for people to read, even students even that are not necessarily 18 yet. So that's one particular source of uh, controversy when it comes to the question of should these programs be used in schools and libraries. The American Family Association is which irony associated with this because, of course, the AFA is one of the most pro-censorship um, groups on the internet. And uh, a while ago, I submitted the URL to Cyber Patrol's review committee claiming that it expressed intolerance towards homosexuals because the AFA website is an extremely conservative site, had a lot of derogatory statements about gays on it. And I claimed that Cyber Patrol's uh, in categories included blocking pages that made derogatory statements about gays and they should block it, and Cyber Patrol did, and AFA eventually found out about it, and, uh, and they were making the... <laughs> Well, okay, I mean, from my point of view, I mean, we don't think that uh, that kind of thing should be blocked anyway, because essentially, um, that kind of, that, the, 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 that kind of uh, hate speech against homosexuals is obviously a lot more effective against adults than it is against children. There's much more, much uh, broader support for anti-gay laws among older age groups than among younger age groups, and that's it's part, of, part of the thinking behind what we do, which is, uh, you know, essentially by combating censorship software, actually advocating more for for younger age groups, but that is, that is an example of where we temporarily switch sides just for fun to see what would happen. Uh, a lot of gay and lesbian rights pages are blocked by uh, 
programs, like for example, CyberSitter has a category for blocking pages like National Organization for Women and Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. And that long one there stands for International Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission, uh, which advocate equal rights for gays. And other programs have been caught blocking uh, political pages about gay rights for the same reason. Um, a website called censorware.org, which is another site similar to peacefire.org and that has a lot of information about blocking software and the politics behind it, was blocked by a blocking software company after censorware.org published a report criticizing that particular company's blocking software product. They added censorware.org for about a day or two to their list of allegedly pornographic sites. And the Cyber Patrol has also blocked some news groups about uh, here out, out atheism and uh, social feminism about uh, political issues. And this is these are not websites, but they've also been a source of controversy as far as concerns. What criteria are they using in determining what's inappropriate for people under 18? And then the last category is uh, the one that peacefire.org specializes in publicizing examples of. Uh, the top example here was an article that I found on the denverpost.com news website. And it was an article about the Catholic Church's responses to the uh, shootings in Littleton. And it was it was an article that didn't have any pictures, let alone any pornographic pictures. There was, uh, there was a, uh, identical to the one that appeared in the paper. There was no way that a human being could have conceivably looked at this URL and determined that it was inappropriate for children, but it had the word bomb in the URL of the title. It was bomb3496.html or something. So my first thought was, it was best was the program was blocking this page. So my first thought was, maybe they're automatically blocking all pages that have the word bomb in them. So what you do is you add some, URL, add some characters to the beginning of the past section of the URL, so it's now denverpost.com slash xxyyzz slash followed by the original path. That URL was not blocked. Um, so clearly they're not blocking all pages that have the word bomb in them, but this page, this particular page, ended up on their list of URLs inappropriate for teenagers. So what they're apparently doing is they have some machine on Bus's network which is going out and crawling for web pages that have the word bomb in the URL and adding those directly to the list of URLs maintained by them without necessarily reviewing them. And Bus, uh, you know, into issue, there's no nice way to say this. They are lying about this. They are sending out letters to uh, potential customers, schools, and libraries saying we review all the URLs on our list to make sure that, that we nothing is added to our list before we have a human being review it and make sure that it meets our criteria. And this is clearly not true because this is a perfect example of something that was blocked even though no human being could have looked at it first. So it's a very important to distinction to uh, to draw when somebody says this page was blocked because it had the word bomb in it. You have to ask, does that mean it was automatically blocked by by some rule that the software uses to block all pages that have bomb in, in the URL, or was it blocked because the company added it to their list of inappropriate URLs? In the former case, it's just an accident. In the latter case, it means the company is lying about what they're doing and should be exposed for that. Um, a second example. Well, there's a page called maplesoccer.org, which is blocked by Cyber Patrol. We couldn't figure out why we went and looked at the page. It turns out it was a, it's a youth soccer league and it had a list of teams and they were categorized under boys under 12, boys under 10, and so on. Apparently the software saw that and thought it was a child pornography site. Uh, Jew Jewishteens.com is an example of a, a site, uh, a pen pal site for Jewish teenagers, and it was blocked by another uh, program which had apparently added all domain names that had the word teens in them to the list of inappropriate URLs. Uh, the elect online electronic, electronic text archive, I think the one called uh, Wiretap, had been blocked as a criminal skills site because there's a quote on the front page, uh, something like, if you give a person a bomb, it will explode once and then its usefulness is over, but if you give them a book, it will keep on exploding for 20 years, 100 years, and its power will never be exhausted. And apparently their, their software scanning machine saw that quote about bomb and thought it was a, a criminal skills site. Um, Another example, a psychologist had her personal homepage blocked because on the part where it said how to contact me, her phone number had the number 69 in the middle of it. <laughs> okay, I made that one up, but all the others were real. Um, 
a little history of the, uh, the controversy and the, and the fight over this. In 1996, that was when the Communications Decency Act passed, and there were some a actually there were some statements for group like, groups like the American Civil Liberties Union and the Electronic Frontier Foundation that came off as actually sounding as if they were now in favor of blocking the software because they thought maybe if we if we, if we put more restrictions on people under 18 using the internet, that will help protect the rights of people over 18. And I was actually 17 years old at that time, so PeaceFire.org was set up to kind of counter that point of view and saying you don't have to trade free speech rights for one group in order to protect the rights of the other. You can you can advocate for both at the same time. 1997, of course, the Supreme Court struck down the CDA, and uh, some some of these groups began switching sides almost immediately. The American Library Association passed a resolution against blocking software in libraries which is, is still one of the most famous documents that the ALA has, has written in recent years. In 1998, there were some court cases involving, one involving the library in Virginia, one in California, that actually the ACLU and uh, ALA sued a library that was using blocking software on the grounds that it violated the First Amendment of the library's patrons, uh, right to freedom of speech, right to freedom of access to information, and they won. And in 1999, there's uh, uh, Senator McCain, who is actually running, running for president, has uh, been pushing for a bill that would require all schools and libraries to use blocking software on their computers, despite some, a lot of the information circulating on the internet about what is wrong with these programs and uh, how they've sort of implemented a very political agenda and made that part of how they decide to block sites. I know I told you I had to... <laughs> no, I told you I'd tell you how to get around firewalls and proxy servers. It's coming, it's coming. Um, Peacefire.org was set up in 1996, like I said, when the controversy over the CDA was going on and people were actually, uh, groups you wouldn't expect it normally from, were talking about blocking software in favorable terms. What we started out doing is putting up pages about uh, Cyber Sitter and Cyber Patrol and what kind of sites were blocked by these different programs that were obviously not uh, meeting their published criteria. Cyber Sitter, for example, uh, is already known as how they blocked National Organization for Women and Glad. Uh, Cyber Sitter also fit filters out words from pages so that the word word like homosexual, if you view it on a page, that it will just be deleted and the other words will be crowded around it. Uh, they even block the word fairy because it's considered slang for gay. So the word fairy will not appear on the page viewed by Cyber Sitter. Uh, shortly after we posted our web page about, and at, at the time we did not actually start posting instructions on how to disable the software and get around them. It was just about what kind of claims they were making versus what was the reality of what was blocked by these programs. Um, eventually, CyberCenter found out about our page, and they added it to our to their list of pornographic sites. And they contacted they contacted our internet service provider and said, "If you don't kick this guy off, we're going to add all 2,500 sites hosted by your company to our list of, of pornographic web pages. In our uh, neighborhood, 1.5 million users will not be able to access anything hosted by your company if you don't kick this guy off." Um, our ISP did not, well, for, fortunately, did not back down, did not kick us off, and CyberCenter after uh, being threatened by our ISP's lawyers, did not go through their plans to block all sites hosted by our ISP, but they did continue to block us, and they uh, put some effort into hunting down mirrors of our sites that had been set up in protest and blocking those as well. Yeah. Uh, Later in April 1997, we put out something called the Cyber Sitter Code Breaker, which was something that you could run on any program that had Cyber Sitter installed on it, and it would read in the encrypted list of sites blocked by Cyber Sitter and print out a text file containing it decrypted. It turns out their encryption scheme was very simple. They had just uh, XORed every byte of the file with uh, hexadecimal 94. So uh, I'm, si I'm, si I'm sitting there looking at a, a hex dump of the file, 949494. Nine Nine four, trying to think, what are they doing? I have a copy of Applied Cryptography, for God's sake, sitting on the desk, trying to figure out what they did, and this uh, hex gun on the screen is just sitting there mocking me. Eventually, I hit on it and, and wrote something we could decrypt the file and print it out for you. Um, CyberCenter, of course, we need their th the threats of a lawsuit at that point, saying we're helping people to steal their trade secrets. And in fact, in er February 1999, it looks like that is what happened. There was a company, uh, ICQ, which was owned by AOL at the time, released a beta version of ICQ 99, which had something called a family filter built into it, which would block certain words from being viewed by ICQ chat participants. And somebody emailed me and said, did you know the ICQ filter is blocking the word peacefire? Now, uh, why would that have any 
nothing to do with us. As it turns out, they had downloaded they had downloaded CyberCitter, downloaded our code breaker, run it on the list, and decrypted it and stolen it without paying CyberCitter royalties. And for a minute, it looked like CyberCitter was going to be able to sue them for like a million dollars because of me, which would have made me really sick. But they they never actually went through it. Someone had a question. <laughs> Oh. oh, yeah, okay. There was, a, there was a company called ClickChoice.com at AOL. It actually hired, hired to compose the list, but they, uh, I mean, they, didn't, they apparently did not ask to see the list after this company gave it back to them, or they didn't examine it very carefully. Quickly, quickly. So in 1998, we started publishing instructions on how to get around the different programs like Cyber Sitter and Cyber Patrol. Of course, a lot of people now would go back and read the old articles about all the controversy over Cyber Sitter blocking our site. I mean, that even made Pointcast on the day that it happened, and people can't understand. Well, of course they block it. Peacefire.org has instructions on how to get around Cyber Sitter. Why wouldn't they? And we didn't have those until 1998, which is why it sparked so much controversy when they blocked us back in 1996. But we did eventually release uh, this information on our page. Uh, we turn the front page into a, a parody of blocking software and marketing program called Winnocence, Innocence Preserving Software for Windows, and uh, had instructions on and how to get around all of our alleged competitor software. Um, and of course, everybody like uh, Cyber, uh, Cyber Patrol and Best that didn't already block our site blocked it then. Um, it has been gratifying to be able to gather this kind of information and publish it because even though we don't obviously have the resources to mount any kind of lawsuits or lobbying efforts on our own, there are a lot of groups like the ACLU and the ALA that are lobbying Congress and lo lobbying the one member libraries not to use blocking software. And uh, like I said, this information has been valuable to librarians, for example, that are defending their non-censored internet access policy. Two people come in and say, why aren't you using blocking software? They have also been uh, in, the, in the lawsuits against the lawsuit against the library that did use blocking software. They were able to use some information from our website about what this program blocked, which proved they, they were not, in fact, reviewing all the sites on their list. Um, and of course, the site has been useful for getting around blocking software to anyone who wants to. Um, I should point out, a lot of people have been skeptical that a, a, a loosely organized group of, of teenagers on the internet really could have gone through and gathered information that was, and sort of become the first of its kind of repository for this kind of information. Um, of course, people at this conference know that a loosely organized group of teenagers on the internet can change satellite coordinates, but most people are a little more skeptical than that. Probably some of the reasons that we've, this has been possible for us is, first of all, I mean, nobody really, there are a lot of people that don't want to criticize blocking software for any reason, if they're, even if they're aware of the problems, just as their word is being branded as somebody who does not want to protect children. We instead got branded as people who were whining because we couldn't get around blocking software, and that's, that's still unfortunate, but it's nowhere near as being accused of being a pedophile because you're an adult telling people how to get, how to get around their blocking software. Um, also, this is not always very rewarding work. Usually what happens if you find out a site that's blocked by a particular company, I mean, it takes a lot of trial and error. You have to download the software, play with it until you find something, and then what do you do? If you publish it, the uh, blocking software company, if it's a really embarrassing mistake, they can take it off their list immediately, and then what if you've proven? And they can then they can say, we still have a perfect record. So we got burned on that a couple times. Nowadays, what we do is if we find a list of sites blocked by a particular program that obviously proves they're lying about what they do, we usually give it to a reporter and have them download the software and verify it first that all these sites are blocked, and then we publish it, and then we have sort of a witness if they accuse us of lying. Um, for a little bit of the political history behind this, last year was when these two lawsuits took place. In Loudoun County, Virginia, a library was sued for using XDOT blocking software on their computers. They said, you and people for the American Way filed this lawsuit, and they won. And part of the uh, testimony was about what kind of sites th this XDOT program blocks. And part of that information did, in fact, come from our website section on XDOT. Um, the other significant lawsuit last year was in Livermore, California, a mother uh, who never, whose name was kept secret from the press to preserve her son's identity, sued the library because they were not using blocking software and allegedly endangering her son. And uh, she lost on the grounds that the library's, uh, the First Amendment applies to libraries so you can't force them to use blocking software. The other controversy that exists sort of outside the whole um, controversy surrounding 
um, companies that make blocking list programs themselves is the uh, push for ratings on people's pages. Um, Microsoft and Netscape browsers now both support ratings on pages where you can set something within the browsers. Um, the word says if this page is rated higher than a certain level, do not let it be accessed for from this computer. Microsoft was a huge proponent of ratings back when their browser was the only one that supported it. Nowadays it's kind of uh, slacked off a little because Netscape has it too. But back when they were a more serious proponent of everybody rating their pages with PIX, which stands for Platform for Internet Content Selection, um, it's hard to find uh, pages about it because if you type pics into a search engine, you get free panel anders and pics and stuff like that. But uh, the, the, the website is uh, w3.org has information about it. MSNBC, which is half owned by Microsoft, about uh, rated their site 0000, which means uh, no sex, no violence, no language, no anything. And uh, somebody wrote them a letter claiming this is dishonest because they, in fact, did have stories on their site about violence, about rape, and they showed a, they showed a little a body of a woman who had been killed in an accident, and they claimed this was that this was unfair. And MSNBC sent back a letter saying, "Well, you know, we want as many people to access this site as possible." And the guy who sent the letter said, "This is hypocrisy. They are applying a different standard to themselves." And this is actually where support for something called the RSAC News uh, Rating Exemption Proposal came from, where, where news sites were saying we'll have a different standard for ourselves. But this is eventually turned down because a lot of uh, web journalists protested that it was unfair that some centralized bureau would have a power decide what constitutes an actual news site or not. Here we go, getting closer. Um, a lot of countries like China and the United Arab Emirates do install, do uh, use blocking programs at the national level. Firewall, uh, China has what they call the Great Firewall of China surrounding the country from which you cannot access certain websites like uh, CNN, for example, and also also Playboy. The UAE, I do not think, block CNN, but they block, uh, they do block Playboy and other uh, sexually explicit sites. Australia has just passed legislation requiring all ISPs to censor uh, incoming traffic from pornographic websites, but the guy who got it passed has just been kicked out of office, so its laws are sort of there and it might be over, it might be overturned. But remember, even though you wouldn't think of places like Australia as being a police state, they have no First Amendment like we do in the U.S., so you can't take it to the Supreme Court and overturn it like we did with the Communications Decency Act. You have to rally public support against it. Uh, Myanmar got so sick of the whole thing, they banned ordinary citizens from owning modems. <laughs> Summer of 1998. Write this down. This is the biggest font I used in the entire presentation. You have to remember this. I did not. I did not do it. Uh, I was supposed to be sharing this presentation with another guy who couldn't make it. He's Brian Restuccia, and probably if I'd been doing this presentation with him, we would have gotten to his side sooner and spent less time on mine. But he didn't show up, so spent a lot of time on my side. Uh, that's how it works. But this this is a proxy server that can be used for getting around uh, firewalls and proxies, unless of course your firewall or proxy blocks it which is what the, uh, what the rest of this presentation is about solving the problem of. This, this will you download a page of this and it will rewrite each URL so that the original URL is replaced with the one that goes through this server instead. Um, how do you communicate through, how do you get to this website without the, uh, without an intermediate firewall or proxy detecting you? First rule is if you want to have a sort of covert communications channel between yourself and a proxy server outside your network, you cannot rely on things like cookies or the, the, the browser uh, self-identifying string to contain any secret information because the proxy server between you and the outside world can strip that information out very easily. You also can't have URLs that are too long hiding lots of data because anyone who's accessing a lot number of long URLs in a row is going to arouse suspicion. Um, remember what Bruce and I was talking about yesterday, steganography only works if you don't deviate from your usual pattern at all, and he's talking that, and that's only necessary if you're talking about a situation where they, that is so draconian that just the fact that you are using encryption is enough to get you in trouble. He mentioned China, well, school is another place, well that's true. Um, as for how the, the downloaded information that you want the pro, your proxy on the outside to send back to you, has, it's a little easier to hide that data because it can be hidden in something like an, an image, which the intermediate censoring proxy is not smart enough to examine to determine whether it's real data or not. Um, so downloads can be uh, d downloads can be encrypted inside of, of a binary image. Okay. Also, hmm? okay. Um, 
also, if you wanted to pass more information to the outside proxy about uh, what URL you really want to see, you can also use requests for images uh, to send more more data at a faster rate. Um, let's skipping this one. The problem is that, like I said, the firewall proxy administrator can block that URL, ians.978.org, so you want to have lots of mirror sites, which the proxy and firewall administrators cannot block them all. Um, and it becomes an interesting problem. With how do you distribute your uh, URLs for the mirrors to your friends without them falling into the hands of spies for the sensorware companies, which will get these URLs reported to the people who make the blocked site lists? Well, let's say that you know that of the people coming to you asking for a mirror location, the proportion of those who are spies working for a blocking software company is about P. So if 100 people come to you, P times 100 of them is uh, are, are spies for blocking software companies. Is P, if P is 0.2, then at least 20 of those people are spies. Um, and you can only, let's make the simplifying assumption, you can only give one mirror to each person. Well, let's say you give a mirror location to N people. You want to maximize the number, the expected number of legitimate users which will have access to that mirror. Well, if you give it to more people, People, more people have access to it, but if you give it to too many people, it becomes very likely that one of them is going to be a spy and is going to get you blocked. So if you give it to n people, the probability that they will all be legitimate users it is 1 minus p to the power n. Um, and of course, if they're all legitimate users, then all n of them will have will have access. If only one of them is a cheater, then none of them will have access. So you want to give the mirror to a to n users where n maximizes the expression n times 1 minus p to the power n, where uh, where P is the, is the proportion of users that are known to be spies. Um, in the real world, those are simplifying conditions that don't apply. Each user can be given more than one mirror. You can give uh, multiple mirrors to a person if you want them to be, in case one of them gets shut down. But of course, if that person's a spy, giving them more than one mirror will result in even more being blocked. Um, and also, you can give out new URLs every week, and you can use data from past handing out of URLs to determine who got the URLs blocked, who is more likely to be a spy. And the, this is a really complicated mathematical problem, actually. And the, the ultimate problem is to maximize the proportion of legitimate users coming to you that will have access to at least one uncensored mirror, uh, given that if someone is a spy, they can get it blocked. But you can use that information uh, in multiple rounds to determine who is most likely to be a spy. Um, for more information about all this, you can visit any of these websites on the screen or email me at that address. Um, I don't know if we can take, if we have time to take two or three questions from the audience. Okay, if you want to ask a question, you have to raise your hand in the, in the first round after. Okay, anyone who doesn't have their hand up after the first 10 seconds, uh, I guess we, we can't take more than, one, more than questions than people have at the very beginning. What? I don't know. Is it, who's speaking next? Who has a schedule? Uh, what is open source by David Gard? Oh. Are, are you in the room? Okay. We'll probably, I guess we can ask answer questions until the person gets here. Who's speaking next? Oh, thank you.